understanding what the economy is and what the economy does is, is, is not very simple. But actually, there are some ways that we can use to, to, to try to understand actually what the economy is and what the economy is doing that I find that are, are more insightful than, than what would be the most traditional approaches. So one question that I always love to ask, you know, when I'm talking about economic complexity to people is to ask them, what is the true difference between an apple that you buy in a supermarket, the apple that grows on a tree, and the apple that you buy in a Mac store and use to check your email? These are both products. These are both highly complex. You know, they're both negative entropy. If you put it from a scientific point of view, they're highly organized pieces of matter. But what's the true difference between the two? You know, they're both highly ordered. You know? But actually, the true difference between the two is the source of the order. So let me tell you why. The apple that you buy in the supermarket, the apple that grows on a tree, is a product that existed first in the world and then in your head. So there were apples before you had markets for apples, before you had a name for an apple, before you had you know, a price for an apple. So they were first in the world, then in your head. The Apple iPhone, you know, or like the Apple that you use to check your email, you know, it's an Apple that existed first you know, in someone's head and then in the world. So you think about those two products are highly ordered, but one of the products you know, crystallizes the order from nature and from self-organization and from evolution, and the other one crystallizes order that emerged first as imagination. So although both are crystals of order, one is a crystal of imagination. So why do we crystallize imagination? You know? So, well, one of the reasons why we crystallize imagination is that by doing so, we're able to share our knowledge and our ideas with others in ways that it would not be possible without making tangible instantiations of them. So imagine now that you buy a tube of tooth toothpaste. Okay? So let's say that you buy a tube of toothpaste. What are you buying? Are you buying some paste on a tube? Not necessarily. Actually, what you're buying is you're buying access to knowledge on how to synthesize sodium fluoride. You're buying access to the imagination of, you know, how do you develop this source of, of chemical synthesis? Because I do not know how to synthesize sodium fluoride, but I make use of the synthesis of sodium fluoride every day when I brush my teeth. I do not know how to build ceramics, but I enjoy them every morning when I sit on the can. You know? I do not know how to manufacture most of the things that I use. You know? And I do not know the knowledge that, that is required I, I don't even have a clue of, of you know, like how those intricate mechanisms that are making those machines work, work. You know, I don't know how to make electrons dance you know, following the instructions of my voice through, you know, uh, through you know, the mobile phone, but, but eventually I can use it. So eventually when we crystallize imagination, we're putting that in a package and a product is nothing else than a vehicle by which we make our knowledge and imagination accessible to others. Also, the fact that we crystallize imagination is something that is extremely human and that is, from my point of view, from my point of view, the main difference between us and other species. So there's a lot of talk out there that they try to make you believe that the prosperity of a nation comes from competition, you know, or comes from, you know, the fact that we're self-interested and selfish. But if you think about it, you know, like hippopotamus or crocodiles or barracudas, they're all quite selfish. You know, so in some sense, the problem of the crocodile society is not that they're not selfish enough, it's not that they're not self-centered enough, it's not that there's enough competition. They have all of those components. You know, the main difference is that they're not able to transform imagination into reality. If you think about it, you know, even the apes that are able to use some sort of tools, the tools that they use are quite primitive. So they can take a stone and they can make something out of that stone. Or a dolphin can take you know, a sponge and can use that sponge to dig holes on the bottom of the ocean and, and get fish or, or, and different things that way. But all of those are just modifications of sort of like one piece. Now, when you have a, something that is as simple as an arrow, that you have you know, a combination of things. So you have you know, a, a little twig and you have you know, a tip that is made of stone and you have a way of connecting you know, that tip of stone to the twig and you have some feathers to make sure that it flies you know, in a straight path. You know, those things that are concoctions of different things, that are combinations of different pieces of matter, is the things that actually we can create and that make us uniquely human. Because they're not simple modifications of things that are out there in nature, but are things that at some point existed only in someone's head as a set of synapses, and eventually you know, were put out you know, into a product that allows that knowledge to be shared that others, with others. So now the question is, well, 
So as a society, we have been able to become rich because we crystallize imagination, okay? And we have created this diversity of things that we are able to enjoy and we're able to operate at this high level of knowledge because we crystallize imagination and we share our knowledge with others, you know, through these packages of knowledge. So why some countries are so much better at crystallizing imagination than others, you know? Why some countries can basically crystallize anything that they can imagine and they can put a man on the moon, while other countries, you know, have still not been able to figure out how to get fresh fish out of a port. And the thing is, in order to crystallize imagination, you don't need just imagination, you need also productive knowledge. These are two things that are complementary. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you imagine a guitar. So you imagine making a guitar, but in order to make a guitar, you need to know how to cut wood, how to shape that wood, how to paint that wood, how to you know, find the wood that vibrates beautifully, how to make it strong enough that it can support the strings. You have to figure out where you have to put those frets so that you would have actually a scale that you can use to articulate chords and notes and make melodies. You need to know how tense you're gonna be able to put each one of those strings, you know? So you actually need a lot of knowledge to be able to transform that imagination into reality. So in some sense, although imagination might be everywhere, everybody can imagine a flying machine, very few people can build a flying machine because in order to do that, you need knowledge. And what happens is that in many cases, the amount of knowledge that you need is larger than the one that you can have in a single person. So here, what we have done is we've introduced this concept of a person byte as the maximum amount of knowledge that a person can hold. So a person, you know, is a person is, is finite. By all means, a person is finite in capacities. And the capacity that it has to accumulate proactive knowledge, we're going to say that is one person byte. So in order to put a man in the moon, you don't need one person byte, you probably need hundreds or thousands of person bytes. Because it's something that you cannot do alone, it cannot be done in a team of two or three or four. You know, it requires a large collaboration of people that percolate the barriers of space, time and anonymity. You know? So you have to have these large networks of people to hold enough productive knowledge to be able to produce that product. And that's sort of like where economic complexity becomes fun, because you see that we have evolved from very humble and simple origins to crystallize imagination to go from, you know, like the fact that we would take an object like a rock and we would shape it a little bit to be able to create concoctions of objects like arrows and then eventually concoctions of objects that are so complex that you have to get a large number of people to participate in it. And as we do so, these networks of people that are required to participate in the economy become larger and larger and larger and larger. So there's a positive side of it. The positive side of it is that we can build cars, we can go to the moon, we can fly around the world, you know, in, in a matter of hours, you know, and half a day. You know, we can go basically almost anywhere in the world. You know? So those are the positive aspects of it. But there are also some negative aspects of it. The way that we think about markets is very different when we realize that as economies evolve, they're creating larger and larger concoctions of people, you know, and networks of people that are required to hold that proactive knowledge. So if you think about the way that people think about markets, there's, there's sort of like a myth going around, which is this Adam Smith Disney interpretation of markets in which you have a horseshoe maker and you have a brewer and you have, you know, a baker and they all like, you know, buy things in the village and sell things in the village from each other and they become more prosperous as they do those things. But if you realize in, in, in that, you know, in that fairy tale economy, the one that produces and the one that consumes, they're, they're basically all of the same. There's very little separation between the agents that participate of these economic activities. Our world is not like that. Nowadays, more and more, our world is made of large, large organizations. If you think about an organization like the World Bank has tens of thousands of people, or a company like Walmart has millions of people, or Foxconn has millions of people, or Apple has tens of thousands of people. And the market is reduced to the interactions that happen between these large networks of people. So it's the interactions that happen between Intel and Apple, or between Apple and Adobe, or between Adobe and Microsoft, or between Microsoft and Fujitsu. No? So are those interactions between these large networks? And those interactions you know, are interactions in which the mechanisms of the market might be operating, but in reality, most of the distribution that happens inside economies is not happening through market mechanisms, because it's happening internally within those organizations. So if the World Bank is going to focus more on gender than it's going to focus on building roads, it's not because there was a market mechanism that determined that, it's because the people that focuses on gender internally within the bank, they were better at convincing their higher-ups that gender was the important issue and not transportation. 
So you think about it, you know, as we continue evolving and we continue developing our capacity to crystallize imagination, we keep on creating these large networks, but as we keep on creating these large networks, the market that enables the creation of these large networks begins to disappear because most of the links and the distribution becomes internal and the market evolves to a set of political systems which are companies or corporations in which the allocation decisions that are internal to them are actually you know, decided based on you know, political battles that are internal and that are not you know, based on the market that thought to have them to allocate in the first place. You can think that economic complexity emerges as an extension you know, of, of making things that are increasingly you know, more complex, of accomplishing things. And, and I think that there is an aspect of human nature in which we want to accomplish things. And that's different of an aspect of having like a self-interest, you know, but it's more of a creative type of endeavor. It's not a consumption goal, but a production goal that we all have. You know? And from that point of view, you know, we look to create alliances with other people so we're able to achieve those goals. Now, in order to enable that to happen, you know, economic complexity needs to evolve with different types of institutions you know, that allow those type of things to happen. So I can tell you a story that can illustrate the interaction between institutions and economic complexity. You know, so Thomas Jefferson he was one of the founding fathers of the United States, you know, and he had this, you know, uh, um, this plantation on a hill in Monticello, and originally he was dedicated to tobacco. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner at that time, and his slaves lived in very poor conditions in the tobacco plantation. But eventually, the price of tobacco plummeted, and, and he was not able to support the farm anymore based on, on the plantation of tobacco, so he had to change the crop. And he changed to wheat and other, and other crops, and, and he realized that the division of labor that was required to plant wheat was much larger than the one that was needed to plant tobacco. Tobacco was a much simpler crop. So eventually what happened, is that as he changed crops, he had to change the whole set of institutions that ran in the farm. The slaves, during the era in which he was planting tobacco, were all at the same level and they all lived in very bad conditions. But then, as he switched from tobacco to wheat, he had to start actually uh, dividing you know, the, the, uh, his workers into different classes and giving them different types of amenities. So, for example, they would have a house for them and their family, which was something that did not happen during the tobacco times. So this shows you that eventually, as societies develop, you know, and as the complexity of products develop, you know, basically institutions co-evolve with them. If you think about it, during the Industrial Revolution and during the beginning of the 20th century, women were not included in the labor force because men all of a sudden you know, became better hearted and more inclusive. It was because actually in factory work, they could be included and they were needed at a time of war. You know? And the complexity of the task was such that it could be divided into smaller subunits in which women and children were able to participate. And that was a point that was made by Alexander Hamilton when he started you know, arguing in favor of manufacturing during the independence of the United States. So eventually what, what you see is that for complexity to evolve, you know, this complexity is always co-evolving with society. And what we make ultimately starts shaping how our society is.